now. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, we it is it is great to be together, and the goal of this really is to it just is to lift our hearts to worship God. You know, uh, worship really is uh, to ascribe value to something. We worship something all the time. We're always ascribing value or declaring something's value. And, and, and to worship God is to reorient our hearts and our lives on the most valuable thing, that God is the creator, sustainer, our redeemer, our friend, and the one who saves us and calls us and invites us to his presence to worship him, just as he saved the Israelites in the Exodus story from their slavery to the Egyptians. He says, free my people so that they can worship me. In the same way, God frees us from the enemy of sin, from the dominion of darkness. He has victory over us in the cross and has resurrected us to new life so that we can have new life and worship him to do what we were created to do, to, to worship him in spirit and truth. And, and that, 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 that worship of him is our, our greatest pursuit, our greatest joy. And it doesn't just include singing songs, but it also includes how we live our life, the ethic of living in such a way where God is great. And Psalm 66 is all about that. So I'm going to read this to us to kind of orient our hearts, to focus our hearts on the God who uh, is a God whom we can worship, who we find our joy in, who we find our victory in, who declares power over our enemies, the enemies of sin and death, so that we can worship him freely. So let's hear the psalm, the call to worship from Psalm 66, uh, verses 1 through 4, and then I'll pray for us, and then Emily will lead us. Uh, Psalm 66 says this, shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name, give to him glorious praise, say to God, how awesome are your deeds, so great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you, all the earth worships you and sings praises to you, they sing praises to your name, let's pray. Father, thank you that, as we've said, as a scattered people, that we can gather virtually to worship you, to declare your greatness, to reflect in your awesome deeds, your salvation uh, that you've purchased for us in Christ, the victory that you've claimed for us in Christ, and the joy that we now have in that we can know you and walk with you and, and have a people of joy that we can do that with. Um, Help us to lift our voices as some of us may be tired, distracted, um, longing for uh, to be out of the season of uh, quarantine and social distancing, uh, longing to be together, even though we can't be just yet. Help us lift our hearts, lift our voices to worship you. And uh, just as this pray from prayer says from the Book of Common Prayer, uh, I'll, I'll pray it now. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires know, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ the Lord. Amen.
regard to you, all hearts are open. You long for more than what this world provides. No child of spring will ever satisfy us. And your river deep runs over everything. Here's my heart, oh, take it. 
Okay, sorry, I keep clicking and it goes forward. I don't mean to do that. I'm just trying to turn my microphone on. Okay, so amen. Thank you, Emily. Um, you know, both those songs and so much of uh, Christian worship music is centered around um, God's grace. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's focusing our hearts and our attention on this thing that we have heard, if you've grown up in the church, your whole life called the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, the, the, the look of God where he sees you, not based upon anything that you've done, said, can do, or will do, but because solely dependent upon his mercy and his love for you. And because of that grace, uh, it says that we are enough, that, that we have enough, and that we are enough. And I'm going to read a, a passage about God's sufficient grace from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. Then I'll pray for us, and then I'll lead us through a little message, and then a short um, uh, reflection time that Emily will, will sing through. So uh, let's read together 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Father, what a radical word. For when I am weak, I am strong. Every message, every thing that we see tells us that for when I am self-reliant, I am strong. For when I am beautiful, I am strong. For when I am worthy, I am strong. For when I have friends, I am strong. Not for when I am weak, I am strong. But it is only by your grace that we can see our humanity, our limitation, our weakness, our insufficiency, and get over ourselves and therefore rest in your sufficiency, your grace, your gospel so that we can be enough father help us to once again reflect deeply on your gospel let it take root into our hearts let it heal us let it calm us so that we can live as a people a sufficient people in in the world that you have us in jesus name amen well, as many of you have heard me talk about, I played baseball in college. I uh, played baseball really since uh, T-ball. So uh, officially, whenever that starts, kindergarten through my sophomore year of college. So that's a lot of baseball. And then I've, I've now switched to transition to softball, which is just like baseball. But I'm, I'm, I'm still on the injured reserve list, still trying to recover and get back to 100% for my leg surgery last year. But in my lifetime, I've had a number amount of, of uh, numerous amount of baseball gloves that I've had to break in. So if you aren't familiar with the process, when you buy a new baseball glove from a store uh, or the internet, uh, and it's a good baseball glove, it's really stiff because it's made out of good leather. The, the, when baseball gloves are not as stiff and they're really, they're really easy to move when you first buy them, they're usually not very good gloves. They're usually going to break down pretty easily. But good gloves that are made from good leather, when you buy them, are really stiff. So when you put your hand in there, the, the, the will of the glove does not bend to the will of the hand. So therefore, you need to take time to loosen up your glove and to work it and to break it in. So I would take a baseball bat and I would hit it against my hand. I would take oil. You can buy like, like oils for, your, for leather and for gloves and you'd rub it in. I would uh, put it, some people put theirs in the dishwasher so it would heat up. Um, we used to put ours in the oven because I don't know why you want to get all wet, but we would put it in the oven for a little bit, let it heat up, and we pound it and massage it, right? And then as you continue to, to, to work it and mold it and massage it, you would eventually, it would begin to loosen up. And over time, 
it would bend, the glove itself would bend to the will of your hand. So therefore, the glove would just be an extension of the hand. And I tell you that because a lot of us are gloves. We, we come into the world, we come into our relationship with Christ, and we're stiffened by the world that we live in. We're stiffened by our own stories. We're stiffened by our expectations, our hurts, our pains, our misunderstandings about who God is. And, and we spend, and God spends the rest of our lives shaping us and molding us and working us by his word, by his spirit, through his people. Um, so that over time, we, we no longer are stiffened by our hearts, our cold hearts of self-sufficiency and, and whatever it may be. And that eventually, uh, we the glove and God the hand, he just, we become and we mold ourselves to the will of the hand, right? So the will of God, and we become an extension as image bearers of God in the world and live by his grace and distribute and demonstrate his, his grace to others. You know, so many of us, going back to the hardness, so many of us are hardened by the lie that in order to be enough, in order to, to be sufficient for others and for God, we must become enough, right? We must have something that we have done or something that we will do or something that, that, that people can see so that they can make the declaration that we have become enough in their eyes, right? Or we, we think that we must have enough in order to be enough. And really what this is all summed up as is that is, is the lie of self-sufficiency. That in order that we think that in order to be sufficient, to be enough, we have to try harder, do more. We have to, um, um, you know, demonstrate that we are worthy people or good people or whatever it may be, right? And really what that does to us is that doesn't soften us. It actually hardens us because it tells us, God, I don't need your hand. I don't need your molding. I don't need your will. I can do it on my own. And the good news from, 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 from the whole of Scripture and that's highlighted for us in this passage tonight is the good news is that by grace we are sufficient. By grace we are enough. And that, and that weakness and difficult and calamity and all those things that are listed in, in, in the passage we just read is that, those, is that God uses those things in our lives like, like glove conditioner for a glove to soften us, to mold us, to, to, to help us so that over time we die to the lie and the hardness of self-sufficiency and we are freed to move about through the freedom of being God dependent. You know, in summary, as a people on a journey to have enough and to be enough, uh, we are a people on that journey to be enough and have enough. In Christ, the good news is that in Christ we are enough. In Christ we are sufficient. Weakness, limitations, insults, hardships, persecutions, suffering, and calamity, all those things listed will often make us feel deeply insufficient. But in Jesus, our experience of these things will lead us to a deeper, deeper sense of sufficiency. How? Because in Christ, we have a redefinition of weakness and limitation and are invited to know that it is okay to not be okay. It is okay to not be okay. Because when we declare that, then we are softened, right? To express faith in Jesus and to find our su sufficiency or our enoughness in Jesus. In order to have that, we must first express and understand that we have a deep sense of our own insufficiency apart from him. And as we just read in this passage, God's grace, it really is enough. That, that God's look upon you, his unmerited favor towards, your, towards you, the, the death and resurrection, the gift of Jesus that he has given to you, it, that is enough for you. That is the deepest need that you have that God has provided for you. And not just that, but because of that, God sees you and relates to you as, an, as you are enough because we have been given the resume the righteousness, the right standing before God, the enoughness of Jesus that has been credited to our account so that God then sees us as enough and relates to us as enough. And in this passage, there are three things, that three contexts that we find ourselves in uh, having our enough in. And the first one was enough in our limitation and that we can boast in our weakness and limitation because it means that we reject the lie of self-sufficiency 
and embrace the freedom of God dependency. You know, we all have weakness, we all have limitation. And this is, is, this is not talking about sin problems, right? This is not talking about ways that we are enslaved to, um, to sin, but it's talking about our human limitation, right? When God created Adam and Eve, he created us, them and us with limitations. He said, you may eat of everything but this. He gave them night and day because they needed to rest and to sleep, right? They have weakness. We have weakness apart from sin because we are created beings. We are not the creator. And we can boast in that reality that we are not enough, even though the world tells us that we must show no weakness. We must show no limitation because we, we, if we do that, then we are enough. It's, it's different in God's world and in God's economy. And because we, can, we are limited people who have been created by the creator with limitations, we can, um, we can embrace our humanity and still be enough in our limitation because it's by God's grace that we are enough, not in what we can do or who we are or what we can, what we can produce. And secondly, is that we are enough in our rejection. We can be content as we are rejected because we find our sense of belonging with Jesus and with his people, whose words have authority over the words of man. You know, it says that, it, says that it uses the word persecution, right? To, to be targeted for your faith in Jesus or, um, or is what that means there, right? We can be enough when we're rejected. Even, even if we experience rejection in this life, we can still be enough because, because the view of man isn't the place where we find our significance and our enoughness, but rather God's view of us. And like I mentioned earlier, his view of us is that he sees us. He has put his gaze upon us, not because of what we have done, but because of his unmerited favor towards us in Jesus. And those words and that declaration and that sufficiency has weight over, has trumps over uh, the words of others who may express themselves in a manner of rejection. And then lastly, it's enough in our tribulation. We can be strong in our suffering because we have a God who suffered and rose above suffering who offers us that same resurrected life in himself, right? It says calamities and hardships is, is the word that it uses in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. We, we can have enough, even though we, uh, we, we experience disorientation, even though we experience suffering and hardship, uh, which often we wonder when we experience hardship is, what did I do wrong? What, why, why is this happening to me? Why, what have I done? Why am I not enough so that these things happening? But what we find out is that Jesus suffered. Jesus was enough, right? He was God in the flesh. He was perfect. He lived a sinless life. He died the sinner's death, right? The perfect man suffered the sinner's death. He was enough, but he still experienced suffering. In the same way, as we walk in this, in this journey, we will experience hardship. We will experience tribulation. We will experience suffering. But we can be strong because we know that as Jesus suffered, we, we identify with him and his sufferings. And we have a deeper sense of our enoughness in Jesus because of the loss of something. Um, that we may find. So as we transition now to a time of reflection, I wanted to think about these three things, right? The three things that I just talked about, the, the, the limitation, rejection, and tribulation. And I want us to focus on how these things have power over us and how, how the only thing that can free us from that is the reality that God's grace is sufficient, that in God and his work, we are enough. And that we are enough from the ways that you hide your weakness and limitations out of fear of being rejected. So many of us are afraid to, to be weak, to, afraid to express limitation because we are, we're afraid that because that will be rejected. We'll, we'll be told that we're not enough. Well, even if that happens, whether that's something that's real or something that you uh, think may be real, the good news is that God's grace is sufficient. From the ways that I let insult and persecution hold power over me, the words of others are strong. They're powerful. I know that. But the good news is that God's word is more powerful and that his grace is sufficient. He declares that to you. And then lastly, from the ways that you run from hardship and calamity, because you're afraid of what they may cost, right? So many of us, we, we, we want to run from difficulty. But if, if difficulty if it, if, it, if it matures us in Christ, if it softens us, right, if it molds us into the will of God in our lives, the will of the Father to, 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 to distribute, to demonstrate his will to others, right, but then we should embrace it and we should accept it because, because God's grace is sufficient. 
So Emily's going to sing a song for us, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So let us turn our eyes upon Jesus now and let us think through uh, these three things. And let us hold true to the promise that God's grace is sufficient. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and a life for abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow for us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonder And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Well, I'll pray for us, and then Emily will, will close us out with, with uh, some songs. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your grace. Thank you that you see us, not based upon our resumes, um, our influence, our possessions, our popularity, or anything that is dependent upon circumstances that come and go but it is upon the timeless truth of your love for us, that you know us, that you knit us in our mother's wombs, as it says in Psalms, that you have called us to yourself in our salvation and now are, are leading us like a good father through this life until the day that we meet you face to face. And thank you that your grace, it is enough for us, and not just that, but it makes us enough for you. Help us to relate to one another in light of this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy. Christ the solid 
Well, as we uh, leave here, uh, from here, uh, I'd love to send you with a prayer and a word, a uh, benediction, uh, to remind us and to keep our hearts centered on the sufficient grace of God. It's from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the, pow by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.